So moving on to the, our second speaker, I am once again delighted to have uh, another speaker and talented individual for us this afternoon. Amit began his career as an Oracle consultant uh, and made the decision to move into data science a number of years back before ultimately joining Autodesk in 2018 as a machine learning engineer. During his time at Autodesk, he's worked on various projects, leveraging AWS services to deploy the machine learning models. Away from work, Amit is a keen sports fan playing and watching football, cricket and tennis. And he has told me he does like to indulge in long drives from time to time. Today, Amit will be sharing with us in greater detail not only how he and the team at Autodesk have tackled the challenge of connecting AI with cloud computing, but Amit would shed light on how AWS SageMaker has revolutionized the AI space and enabled them to overcome the various constraints of memory, speed, and resilience through their using serverless infrastructure to deploy their own models through AWS and provide a client-facing endpoint. Ladies and gentlemen, I will leave it in the capable hands of Amit uh, and I look forward to hearing what he has to say. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for the fancy introduction. Um, so my uh, objective or my presentation would be uh, revolving more about uh, around the SageMaker because it's a new service. It's a very new niche service for uh, to, to be able to do machine learning uh, with ease and to make and monetize your uh, machine learning models. So I just share my screen to play the presentation. Okay. So I work for Autodesk as uh, Sean already kind of introduced me. This is a bit about me. Uh, I'm basically a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. I didn't know uh, computers or programming languages for a while. I mean, all I knew was to play the games and watch movies while I was doing my mechanical engineering. Uh, knew a bit of Autodesk, uh, one of the products like AutoCAD because I was uh, in mechanical. After that, I worked as an Oracle Finance Consultant for a while, and then I decided to move in the space of data science because I thought that AI is moving very fast and uh, it's good to know uh, the future of the tech. Currently, after doing the masters, uh, I'm working as a machine learning engineer with Autodesk. Uh, I joined Autodesk in December 2018, so it's more, almost kind of one, one and a half year to me, more than one and a half year to me now. Uh, before we say, okay, so about Autodesk, uh, uh, Autodesk is actually, we, uh, I don't know, because more, sometimes I feel like most, most of the people, they kind of don't understand what Autodesk does. But uh, we have our flagship products like AutoCAD and Revit and Inventor. Uh, to put it in a nutshell, we make software for people who make things be in the space of automobile, uh, aerospace, manufacturing, construction, media and entertainment because uh, softwares like 3ds Max are again uh, by Autodesk. I'll quickly play a short video just to give a uh, kind of uh, broader perspective on what Autodesk does. We make software for people who make things, like your car, your house, your city, and even last night's creepy alien. But that's just for starters. We also make software that talks to robots, 3D prints fashion, and folds DNA. This is software for tomorrow, because the future is coming, and it is impatient, and it most certainly won't be quiet. And it will change us all. How we design, how we collaborate, how we build, how we make. It doesn't matter who you are. We all have a stake in what's next. Because the challenges are mounting and they'll need solutions we haven't even thought of. So it's time to get to work. At Autodesk, we give you the power to make anything. What are you going to do with it? So that was a quick overview of what Autodesk does and uh, what we actually primarily do. Uh, I'll move on to the problem statement that we were trying to solve while uh, we came up with the idea of trying to use serverless uh, uh, with AI. Um, the issue at hand was that uh, we have a legacy test test solution, which is nothing but it's a it's an automated uh, test result solution. So we uh, we release multiple versions of our products uh, like Autodesk or Revit Inventor. And then we kind of test it. So we have a rule-based engine which tests those uh, uh, various releases of the product and it identifies certain errors and it kind of flags those errors at true or false, at true or false. Once it, they are uh, flagged as true or false, they're actually uh, stored in the test test management system, which is nothing but uh, it's, it's a, a simple system which kind of uh, stores the result. 
Now the issue was that uh, we have almost 90 products, uh, three releases every year in, in 13 different languages, which is almost like 40 uh, for 40 versions for one uh, release, which is like almost 120 into 90. So we have almost millions of records that come into test desk management system and somebody has to go and verify whether the results are true or false and whether they have been identified correctly because uh, you don't want to let a true positive error go into the product. So, uh, and it's, it's, you know, you need vendors and you need, you need people to go manually into the, uh, into the system and uh, look at whether it's a true or positive error. It's highly repetitive, uh, high cost, high turnaround time because you can't release a product unless you have verified all the errors. Um, it's a resource drainage because we need a lot of manual intervention and a lot of human hours, which is again a cost. Uh, so we came up with the idea of trying to uh, leverage AI for this solution. So if you see on the left side, on the top, you see the Jarvis machine learning engine, which is actually nothing but uh, we built, we are replacing the whole test solution with the machine learning solution, which will actually, uh, which was trained on the 10 years of data, uh, which we had in the system. And it can identify the, it can verify the true or false using uh, the model that we have trained. It eliminates the human touch points, reduces time and cost, reduces turnaround time, and definitely reduces uh, the resource consumption. Uh, definitely does reducing the cost. So we identified the problem, we made a solution, we got the models trained, but is our solution ready? Uh, as a data scientist, I work as a data scientist. Uh, my primary job is to uh, train the models, but the next step, once you have trained the models is equally important, uh, or I would say actually far more important because there is no point doing AI unless you can put it in production and you know you can if you can be able to uh, use it in the business case and monetize AI. So that is the place uh, where it's very important to understand how we can uh, just give me a second. Yeah, how we can uh, deploy our solution. So we were we asked our question. Uh, the question to us is how can we can deploy the solution on cloud and make it user facing. Uh, uh, SageMaker was the service uh, released uh, uh, recently, so we tried to, we thought of uh, going along with SageMaker and try to see, uh, is it possible for us to bring our own solution on uh, AWS? So we thought of creating, going serverless with uh, AWS to deploy our models and uh, make AI solution. Um, the tech stack that was used is Docker, Python for writing the scripts, machine learning model because it's primarily uh, an AI service. And the services like S3, SageMaker, Lambda, API Gateway, ECR for containing uh, or storing the Docker images, and IAM for access management. What is SageMaker? Uh, SageMaker is a fully managed service by AWS. You can build, train, and deploy. It's a brilliant service. You can even label your jobs now uh, with they have a functionality known as ground truth. Uh, you can label your data, which is a big problem in uh, in the space of AI, that you get data, but uh, you don't have a labeled data because uh, once you have the data being labeled, it is easier to uh, build a machine learning model and uh, with, with more accuracy. Uh, you can build, train, and deploy your models on Azure, uh, Amazon SageMaker. We have three different API labels. One is high-level API, mid-level API, and low-level API. We are using low-level API because you would, if you are trying to bring your own solution, you have third-party uh, trained models. You need to use the uh, your own own Docker images in which you can place your own code and models. Uh, this is just a quick snapshot of uh, how the whole architecture would look like. So we have a SageMaker service which hosts our model and everything, and it creates a generates a model endpoint. Uh, we have placed a Lambda in place of the SageMaker, which actually invokes the SageMaker endpoint. And we have an Amazon API gateway to invoke the Lambda and actually generate an API endpoint, which is public facing and you can access that API. Uh, before moving on to, uh, so uh, the I think the primary, the most of the time was being spent on uh, exploring SageMaker and how could we uh, deploy our models. Uh, so the endpoint requisites, prerequisites are that the model should be, your AI model should be uploaded in S3 because the SageMaker expects it uh, to be, uh, it kind of 
uh, loads that model on runtime from S3 uh, to keep the memory consumption low. Uh, IAM role should be defined with access to SageMaker and S3. Uh, prediction on inference code should be dockerized uh, by which prediction and inference code. I mean that if you're trying to make a service which uh, the end, end user will use to get the prediction out of, uh, out of the machine learning model, uh, you have to write your own custom prediction code unless you are using the inbuilt uh, AWS functionality. And the Docker image should be posted to the ACR. All services should be under the same region, primarily to make it easy uh, for the integration. This is a, a very uh, detailed architecture of how what uh, SageMaker actually does internally. So if you see, you have the uh, model artifacts, which is nothing but your model on S3. And uh, this is the internal uh, directory structure of the SageMaker. It has their own internal uh, directory structure. Uh, the important thing here is to understand that we need to maintain the same directory structure if we are bringing our own custom solution, which I did in our case. Uh, these are how we created the SageMaker endpoint. If you see on the left, it is a model setting. So first you create a model which is nothing but uh, if you see the container image, which is a Docker image, we, which is we pass the path of the image on the ECR. On the right, we take this model and create an endpoint configuration. Once the configuration is done, we create an endpoint and we use that configuration that was created. Uh, so for Lambda to invoke uh, such SageMaker, we need a SageMaker endpoint, which is on the left. And we need a IAM role which would have uh, access to read access to SageMaker and the cloud virtual access to generate the logs. Uh, this is a snapshot of how the Lambda works. So if you see here, there's an endpoint. Uh, we pass the endpoint name as the environment variable and we call, we invoke the endpoint in the Lambda like this. There is an API invoke endpoint. Uh, you pass the endpoint name and you give your payload. Payload is nothing but the data that you want to run against the model and generate the output for prediction. This is an API gateway. So we are done with the uh, SageMaker uh, endpoint. Then we have placed a Lambda. Now we want to uh, invoke that Lambda. So we placed an uh, API gateway. If you see here, we are integrating it with the Lambda function and we are using the Lambda that we have generated so that we can invoke that Lambda uh, to get the endpoint uh, activated. We have covered almost the theory um, of how things look like. Uh, it would be good to see it in practice. So I'll quickly share my screen. The first thing that I would go is that primarily because it's an AI solution, uh, uh, the, the main difficulty lies in if you're bringing your own solution. We, we, we did not use uh, AWS models, inbuilt models. We, were, uh, we had trained our own models and we were trying to bring that to AWS. So to that, you have to, we need a Docker container. As you see, uh, this is a Docker container that I have created. Uh, for example, I'm using XGBoost as, uh, uh, as the model uh, framework to generate uh, the classification output. Uh, one more thing that I would like to highlight here is that AWS actually internally uses Flask structure. And uh, so you see these Engine, Nginx serve and WSGIPy files well because of the Flask structure. Um, the main thing to note here is the predictor.py. This is the code that will actually, wherein you write your custom code to do the prediction. This is very important because uh, you do all your data manipulation because it's an AI engine. We are, we are trying to do uh, uh, machine learning here. Uh, we have a trained model. We want to make sure that the data that you're feeding into the model is in the same format as the data that the model was trained on. So you get the data in and you Can do we, the- Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we can't see your other screen right now. Okay, sorry. Sorry for the interruption. Oh, sorry, sorry, no, sorry, yeah. Thanks, Gary. All right, hope is, is, is it visible now? Yeah, that's there now. <laughs> oh, sure, sorry. So I'll, I'll go again. Uh, so this is, uh, if you see, this is the container structure that I've created, the Docker container, uh, which primarily is very important. So this is the whole container, that Docker container. You create a Docker image and you push it to ACR. 
uh, I'm using the XGBoost framework here, the model, and uh, to do the classification terminology. And uh, if you see all these files, Nginx serve and WSGI, these are nothing but, uh, these are the uh, Flask framework files because AWS internally uses Flask framework, or the SageMaker uses Flask framework to uh, load the model at runtime and do the prediction output for us. Uh, the primary file or important file here is a predictor.py. Uh, which actually is the file which you make, which you can, when you're bringing your own model, you write your own prediction code. Um, this is very important in the case that if you are bringing your own model, you want to do some data transformation uh, uh, on, on the data that is coming in to make sure that the data is in the same format as your model was trained on, so that there's no ambiguity in the prediction once the machine learning model runs through the data. Once we have all these files ready, this is primarily the most important file. You can write your own custom code. Uh, another important file is the Docker file. Uh, this is important because we want to, uh, in case we want to upload uh, the dependencies because it's, uh, it's a machine learning code. When you upload the model or when, you, when you're running the prediction code, there might be certain Python dependencies or any language that you're using to kind of to be loaded at runtime like I'm using scikit-learn, I'm, I'm downloading XGBoost, I'm downloading pandas. So the Docker file is important. You, uh, you'd load all your dependencies in the Docker file. And uh, the important thing is here is that the work directory should always remain off program because this is exactly the directory which SageMaker maintains internally. So here actually I would say XGBoost. So we copy these XGBoost, this XGBoost folder to the Docker file and we create the Docker image. Once we have the Docker ready, uh, we just use a simple uh, build and push uh, shell script. Uh, and it actually, if you see, it takes the, at the runtime, it takes the account name, the region, and the image, image is the parameter that you pass when you run this script to generate the, to tag the image, uh, Docker image that you are trying to push. Once you run this image, it actually, you see the Docker push. I've commented here because every time when you're testing, you don't want to push the image again and again. You want to first build it and test it locally. So once this is done, uh, then I'll show you where we can see it on the console. So I'll go to, once you run that code, I'll go to ECR. and you see all your uh, images here. So I've created, I'm, I'm not gonna call create because it takes a lot of time to create one image. It takes almost 10 minutes uh, because it loads the model and it runs all the dependencies. So this is already a cre image, image create, which I created earlier. Uh, the good thing is that, you know, you see here multiple versions being run. So every time you push an image, uh, you don't have to change the name. You can keep the name same but you can generate the version. So it, it, it's, it makes it easier to roll back in case you want to roll back to a previous Docker image. Uh, you can always tag that image and then you can uh, proceed ahead. Now that we have our uh, image in the ECR, so we have our prediction code as the image. Uh, what now we need is a model, a S3 model, uh, machine learning model that I placed on S3 and uh, the important thing about the model is that uh, SageMaker, it kind of expects this in the format of .tar.gz, so it has to be zip file, uh, and it actually, uh, it always by default expects the model to be in this format. We have our model, we have our uh, image on the ECR. Now we go to the SageMaker and uh, we can see, so if you see the SageMaker on the left, you can, label the jobs, you can train your algorithms, you can uh, do the inference and prediction. Uh, they also have their marketplace where you can use their inbuilt algorithms, which I didn't do in my case. Uh, in my case, I'll be highlighting or uh, focusing more on these three because inference we are trying to actually, we have already trained our model. All we, all we need SageMaker to do is to facilitate our prediction uh, mechanism. So the first thing that you would require is to generate a model. You go to the model and uh, create a model. You can give a name. 
the IAM role, which I, uh, I discussed earlier in the slides, that we would need an IAM role to access uh, S3 and SageMaker S3 because we'll be loading our model from S3. Uh, you have multiple input options. You can use the uh, package subscription from Marketplace. You can use a model package, package resource. I'm using the first one because we have, we are, I'm using model artifact and inference image location. So model artifact is nothing but uh, the model that has been placed on S3 and uh, inference image location is the name, uh, is the image that, that is currently on ACR. We're using a single model here. So if you see, I can pass the inference code image here, which is uh, the path to ACR and the path to S3. And that's all you need. And I'll quickly show you how it looks like. So I've already created one. So this is a model that you have, I've already created. It uses this IAM role and it is using this uh, AWS CatPred latest image. If you see here, which is the AWS CatPred latest version of that. And uh, it is using the model or tar gz from S3 AIXG Boost, which is nothing but my model for in the bucket AIXG Boost and in the format of tar gz. Uh, so once model is done, uh, uh, we need to build an endpoint configuration on the top of model. We can go to the endpoint configuration. It's pretty straightforward. You just need a uh, kind of configuration name. And when you click add model here, it'll show all the models that you have created. You can use multiple models here. You can cre create all your models and you can keep changing the configuration based on the model that you want to use to make the prediction. Uh, we are using the CatPred, which we have uh, created. And I'll show you how the configuration looks like. Yeah. So if you see here, it uses the model, which is CatPred, which is nothing but the model we just kind of created. Yep, so this is the model that we had created with the uh, S3 location and the Docker image. So we created the model now, or the configuration. Uh, we can go to the endpoint. So it, it's kind of a very sequential. First, you need a model. And if you if you kind of visualize it, it's very easy that when you're when you're trying to create a model, what you need is a prediction code and a model. So you pull your model from S3, you pull the Docker image to run the prediction code, and then you generate configuration. Once the configuration is generated, uh, you go to endpoints, and you can use that configuration to generate the endpoint. Like I have done here, uh, it is using the configuration as uh, the one that I already created, which is this one. So once you have done all this, the endpoint is uh, pretty forward. It's pretty straight, easy. Uh, I can see that it's in service now. So our endpoint, uh, SageMaker endpoint is done. Uh, looks straightforward. It's a bit tricky on the part when you try to generate the image for uh, the Docker image for the models, because that's where the whole lot of work goes and try to identify what your prediction code should look like, uh, the flask structure, and uh, the dockerization takes the most of the time. Now that we are done with the SageMaker, the next component is to place the Lambda in place of the Sage, in front of the SageMaker. I'm using a Lambda here as, uh, uh, sorry. So this is the one that I'm using here, which is call ML endpoint, which is nothing but it's trying to call the SageMaker endpoint. If I open this, I can quickly show you the code. Uh, the function code, it's nothing but it takes the endpoint name as the environment variable, which we are passing here, which is the SageMaker endpoint uh, variable name, uh, uh, the endpoint name. We are passing it as the environment variable. We store that uh, calling the function, and uh, once we have, then we take the payload, uh, the data that you want to run the prediction on and try to get the output. You put it as the payload and you pass the payload and the endpoint name. And in, uh, this is uh, the internal API and work endpoint, which actually calls the uh, SageMaker endpoint. Once this is done, you can get the output. I can quickly show that it works. So if you see here, this is the uh, 
code that uh, this is the data that I'm passing in or some random uh, features. And uh, just give me a second. So uh, yeah, uh, this is the data that I'm passing in to do kind of uh, the prediction right now. And uh, we can run this. We get the output, if you see. So the output that I'm getting is that I was trying to be, the, as, as I told you in the beginning, we were trying to identify whether the error is true or false. And what is the probability? So because the data is random, so the probability is pretty high, but it says that the predicted error is false with a probability of say 99%. It might change on because the data is dummy data. If you see the real time data, it'll, uh, it'll show you the real time probability. Um, once we have the endpoint working, the Lambda working, the next thing is to expose this Lambda uh, using the API gateway. Uh, and the API gateway that I'm using here is invoke endpoint Lambda. Um, be straightforward. I created a resource, and uh, the important part here to mention is the integration request, where I'm just integrating it with the Lambda and the Lambda that I've created here, uh, just to kind of uh, make it more secure. We have used the API keys. So I have generated an API key, and uh, to if anybody wants to invoke this Lambda, uh, to invoke this API gateway, then they would need this uh, API key so that not everybody is kind of generating output from the event. So we have the resources here. We have the integration request. Uh, I can quickly test it. So I'll pass the same data that I have for testing the Lambda. can test whether this is able to call that Lambda and give us the output. And we'll see the, it gives us the same error. So it, you know, you can call this API uh, to get the output and you can see the output, whether it's true or false with a probability of how does it looks like. But the challenges were that uh, because uh, we were kind of uh, trying to do this for the first time, uh, we thought, why not we use the Lambda directly, but it ran out of prediction, or it ran out of memory when it tries to load the model because I think it, uh, Lambda has uh, quite a, a limitation on memory. Even we tried to use the layers, but we couldn't do that because uh, the model size was very high. So it couldn't be used. Uh, that's when we moved on SageMaker. SageMaker being a new service, there was not much documentation, um, especially on, uh, I'm sure now they have because it's been almost one and a half years since we did this or one year since we did this, uh, but uh, how we can uh, integrate third party solution, which is kind of, which is the trickiest part to kind of integrate your own models. It's easier if you're using their inbuilt models and algorithms, but if you are bringing your own AI solution, it, it kind of creates a different level of complexity, uh, try to dockerize the solution. Uh, took a while to fill the gaps on dockerization of our own model to integrate with SageMaker uh, local testing is not quite simple. And of course, I mean, uh, it requires knowledge of Docker's flaws, KWS, and a bit of programming skills. Uh, one more thing I would like to say that since SageMaker, we also tried to explore a new architecture, which was if we could use these Fargate clusters. And uh, we had uh, also explored that solution, but which we haven't productionized it, that you can still uh, use those uh, Fargate clusters to do this as well. Brilliant. Thanks, really enjoyed that. I mean, it's something different for us to have a look at. Um, we've, we've played around with the idea of machine learning before in some of the webinars, but not had quite as much in, uh, in yeah, detail as what you thought. I think most of the times we do AI, but um, it, like deploying the solution is equally yeah. uh, you know, important. And to monetize it, you need to be, have that maintenance scalable. Yeah, absolutely. We were chatting briefly just before we came on air um, about some of the other solutions uh, to AWS SageMaker. It's one of the spaces that's constantly evolving the service community in general. But in the AI space, is there any alternatives that you, you talk about Fargate clusters? Is there anything else out there that might be comparable for people to look at and consider as another alternative? 
And yeah, I, I think, but primarily like uh, SageMaker is a good solution uh, that I have explored, but uh, Fargate cluster is uh, equally good because it takes away, uh, because SageMaker endpoint is always active. So Fargate cluster is easily scalable, but I think uh, to look at the way they have created the whole configuration of SageMaker, I would recommend if anybody wants to deploy, they should use SageMaker because they, they have disintegrated all the different parts. And you can, you know, like create your own models and you can change the models without changing the whole Docker image, or you can change the configuration without changing the endpoint. So the way they have broken down uh, the whole points, I think SageMaker is a brilliant service to do it. Okay, okay. Because I've seen some have kind of highlighted that depending on the size or how deep the models are, that can run into problems. Is that something that you use encountered in Autodesk or was for the most part, I know it's not always seamless, but was it a, a straightforward enough solution that you did end up finding? No, no. So it was kind of a very uh, tricky part. I mean, I think it took me almost one and a half months to figure out how to. It's easier to use SageMaker if you're using their in uh, built-in algorithms, but if you're bringing your own custom model, then it kind of it creates a bit tricky complexity. But right, yeah, all in the game. Yeah. Yeah, this is it. This is it. We've had some interesting questions just on, I suppose, Autodesk and how you kind of came up with these training models. One from Domenico there. He did show a, a real-time machine learning power prediction within the serverless architecture. Did you also use that machine learning as live data within Autodesk? Um, and if so, how are you using a similar yeah. sort of architecture? So we, are, we are actually using it live data. So well, as soon as the product release is done and the results are loaded in the test test solution, which I showed you, we have replaced that with a web service. So it, as soon as the, the results are loaded in the database, it kind of the web services invokes uh, before uh, the web service internally invokes the whole architecture. It goes to the SageMaker, gets the output, and it stores in the database against the, the records, the test, test results that have been put. So we are using web services to do this at runtime. Yeah. This is a very small part of what we have done. It is a big architecture, but uh, everything is at, uh, dynamically and at runtime. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, I think we've got one more before we go to the panel discussion there, but coming from Paolo, he's asked, I think you might have answered this, but when it came to how much time you spent on developing the training models versus the infrastructure, what was the kind of the time split there and how long did that take you all together? Um, see, as a data scientist, I would be biased towards um, training the models. Uh, it was, uh, I think that's the most important part because uh, uh, it's an industry data, it's a real time scenario. So, you know, it, to understand the whole data, uh, label the data and to come up with the features. It took me almost like uh, one and a half month to do the whole data, uh, you know, uh, exploration and then the model and the training didn't take much time once you have the features in place. Yeah. Um, but the deployment again, it took the equal amount of time because I was new to SageMaker. Once you have figured it out, it wouldn't take much because then it's a kind of, you know, that you, all you need is to create a Docker image. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, brilliant. Really, really enjoyed that. One last one there for you, Amit, just before we head off. We were looking at all terms of solutions. Aside from AWS SageMaker, where do the likes of Microsoft and Google kind of compare with that in terms of their product deployment? Amazon have very much taken over the market from the AWS or from a serverless perspective. But well, where does the competitor sit? Is there people coming challenging through or new functions and services that might be worth taking a look at over the next couple of months? And yeah, uh, you can use the Microsoft services, uh, Azure solutions, uh, their cognitive services. But I think uh, the good point with, uh, the good thing with AWS is that uh, most, the whole architecture, they have kind of broken down that into components, but which makes it easier to, it's like, you know, it's like uh, building blocks. There are multiple building blocks and you have to put them together. So it's kind of more easy, it's facilitated nicely. It takes away a lot of work, uh, the integration components, because you don't need to actually integrate it. You just put your pieces in and it kind of runs it together as a component. So I think, yeah, I, I mean, frankly speaking, I think SageMaker is evolving very fast. A lot, not a lot of people understand SageMaker still. I mean, it took me a while for me to understand as well, uh, but it's a brilliant service, I think. I would recommend AWS SageMaker, yeah.